We are joined now by a longtime NBA analyst, observer, and all-around transom peaker and general busybody, Howard Beck, who's going to explain to us in ways that Amin El Hassan could not why the Western Conference of the NBA is basically run by drunks. Howard, welcome. <laughs> What's happening, Ray? How are you? Uh, the same old gut-wrenching nightmares as ever. Um, explain, if you can, how it is that after 60 games, the NBA's Western Conference looks as much of a mess as it still does. I mean... I think this is a glass half full, glass half empty thing, right? Like, is it a mess or is it just really compelling and competitive? Um, you know, the age of super teams is either gone or at least on hold. And so that's part of this, right? There is no superpower because there are no super teams. And, and super teams to me are, you've got not two stars. Because like Shaq and Kobe was two stars. That was not a super team. A super team is three. A super team is like the Pierce, Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett thing, the then LeBron, Bosch, Wade thing that was in response to the Celtics thing. We don't have that right now. There are no super. There are some really, really good teams and some talented teams, and the Suns are trying to construct one. We'll see what happens when Kevin Durant actually steps into the lineup and what they've got. But Chris Paul is so late in his career that I don't consider them that either. So we've got a bunch of teams that have one or two stars, and they've all got some flaws, and no one can truly reign supreme. All due respect to the Nuggets, who have the record and the trajectory of a team that should be by far the best in the West. They've got a nice lead, but I don't think anybody believes in the Nuggets at that level. They're obviously really, really good, and they could go to the finals, but they don't feel like some overpowering, dominant superpower that we were used to in this uh, in this league. Um, so it's just really competitive. There's a weird equilibrium that's kind of settled in, and it's probably due to like 50 different things, not least of which is that everybody's trying harder than they used to because of the play-in, in part because of the, the changed lottery odds. There's less incentive to tank, and if the, if the bottom teams or the middling teams aren't leaning into losing, then they're not giving up as much talent to the better teams who then fatten up on the lower teams that they can take advantage of. So all of these things have probably kind of conspired, and maybe even some of the CBA tweaks over the last 10 years that were designed to try to create a little bit more equilibrium, whether that's the luxury tax or or whatever else. But I don't think there's any one thing, and this may be temporary. This may be temporary until we get through this season and some of these teams that feel like, well, if it's this wide open, I'm one move away from pulling away from the pack, and maybe we see moves this summer to try to accomplish that. I guess, though, what I'm talking about when I say this mess is the fact that from Phoenix in the 4 to Oklahoma City in the thirteen. Every team is separated from the team below it by half a game. That to me is a mess. Not a bad mess. I'm I'm all for this, but I've never seen any any conference in any sport as genuinely congealed as this with no team looking as though it can break out of this pack. It is wild. And and I've never seen it either. Um you know, look, there's some interesting hypotheticals here or, or, or alternate realities, right? Um, in an alternate reality uh, that where Durant went to the Suns last summer, maybe the Suns would be far and away the best team in the West right now. In an alternate reality where Steph Curry never gets hurt, maybe the Warriors are still looking like defending champs and they're, they're lording over the West. In an alternate reality where Paul George and Kawhi Leonard were healthy all season. So injuries have a lot to do with some of this equilibrium. Um, and then you've just got teams that, you know, the Timberwolves went all in on Rudy Gobert and it didn't pay the dividends that they hoped for. And so they're just this middling team, um, that is stuck a half game be- below the team that they acquired Rudy Gobert from the jazz who were supposed to be tanking and yet, uh, have overachieved all season. Uh, so you've, everybody's just in this weird spot, right? The Trailblazers, in, in a different time or a different franchise, might have pulled the plug a long time ago, but they keep trying to rebuild on the fly around Dame, including moves they made at the trade deadline. So they just keep hovering in the middle of the pack. Uh, it was Kevin Pritchard, who's now with the Indiana Pacers and was at the time running the Trailblazers 10 years ago or so, who I believe coined the phrase treadmill of mediocrity while at the Sloan uh, Sports Conference. And the, it just feels like, uh, half of the West is on the treadmill of mediocrity. Again, the why, at least part of this is that the play-in tournament has incentivized the bad teams to be just good enough 
to be in the 7 to 10 range and the teams that are in 11 and 12 to keep trying to get to 10. So I, I do think that's a lot of this. Howard, I don't know if you just heard the, the news that came down. LeBron James' foot injury, I guess, is pretty pretty bad. He's out already tomorrow. He's going to be out for a, a long period of time, it looks like. How does that affect the West? I know people were just starting to get hot on the new-look Lakers, but with LeBron out, I mean, Lakers are pretty much done, right? It depends on how long. We don't know how long still. Um, you know, if it's a week or two, that's one thing. If it's a month, you know, that probably sinks them. Uh, they did a nice job at the trade deadline. Uh, as somebody who's been incredibly critical of the front office there, I will say they did a really nice job at the trade deadline of finally constructing a team that made sense around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And had they done those things last summer or October, November, December, maybe the Lakers wouldn't be in the predicament they're in now in the first place. They looked, I mean, look, as, as we speak, you know, the LeBron injury aside, at the moment, they are, you know, a game out of the play-in and like two and a half out of sixth and three and a half out of fourth place. I mean, it's, inc- it's incredible. Back to Ray's point about how, how packed, how tightly packed the West is. The Lakers healthy get on a, new, a nice winning streak and they've been, you know, what are they, four and one or five and one since the trades? Um, had every possible, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 every possibility of moving up in the standings and being in the playoffs and not even having to mess with the play in. LeBron's injury does change that, of course. We don't know how long he's out. Um, but I, I am one who still believes that a healthy LeBron and a healthy Anthony Davis, surrounded by a competent supporting cast, which they do have now and which they did not have before, is a threat. It's a viable threat. Um, you know, April's still a ways off. We'll see how long he's out, and we'll see what that does to them. But the way things are in the, in the West right now, um, I'm still not ruling out anything for the Lakers as long as LeBron can get healthy quickly. We've been talking about, you know, most of the Western Conference, so the, the teams that are, you know, still have something to play for. But one of the two that is only playing to lose is San Antonio, who's now lost 16 straight. And over their 47 losses this year, their average margin of defeat is like 16 points. Is this the most efficient tanking you can ever remember seeing, just in terms of night after night... We're losing by 15, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I don't remember what the margin of losses were for the tanking Sixers um, when they were tanking for Embiid and tanking for Simmons and just tanking, period, for however many years that was. Um, That was a pretty impressive tank job there. You know, the Spurs started off, you know, this particular uh, tanking effort by trading DeJounte Murray to the Hawks, and... You know, they've got some decent young pieces, you know, Keldon Johnson and some other guys. But, they, you know, they're, they're they're doing what they have to do. You know, as proud of a franchise as that is, and the fact that Pop is still there and all that other stuff, they're a small market team at the end of the day that, by their, by, by their own uh, accounting, will tell you, we were very fortunate to get Tim Duncan, and he made us all look really smart for a long time. They say that themselves. Um, there's some truth to that. There's some false modesty in that. They also drafted really well with guys like you know, Tony Parker and Ginobili and Kawhi, or it was a trade for Kawhi, but a draft day trade. So they did a lot of smart things for a very long time. And eventually you lose your stars and your, your fortune runs out and um, you're a little bit of, of, of beholden to lottery ball bounces and all this other stuff. And, you know, they're still a really smart operation, but there's only so much you can do when you're not a destination. No one's forcing a trade to San Antonio, and no superstars are going there in free agency. So there aren't that many other paths to respectability again, aside from just trying to draft high. So they're they're playing the odds. I, I, I can't fault them for it. Howard, you talk about the treadmill of mediocrity and which teams are going to be able to elevate past that. Do you think the Warriors could do that? And also, do you think that they might need some help in the buyout market in order to do that. We see this, this you know how it is, Howard. So now Nerland's Noel reaches a buyout and now Dub Nation on our Xfinity Mobile call line, text line. Everybody wants to know, well, what about Nerland's Noel? Do you think the Warriors can get past this treadmill of mediocrity? And do you think they can do it alone? Or is there a buyout piece that could add to this team and get them over the hump? I, I don't know that anything is going to fix the Warriors from outside. Um, I, I think their best case scenario right now is Steph comes back soon. 
Gary Payton Jr. gets back sooner than later and can play at the level that he did in the playoffs last year. And then you've got, you know, a, a seven man core that is familiar and has a history and, and, and knows what it can do um, when the games matter most. And maybe some things lock in or, or, or click back into place the closer to the playoffs they get. But, you know, even healthy this year, they've been kind of up and down. It's been great to see, you know, Clay having these moments, especially when Steph has been out. That's really encouraging. It's hard to buy into a team that's a game over 500 as a contender, except this one. Like, they're the only team I, w- I could ever think of. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I'm still doing this with the Lakers a little bit too, right? Like, oh, if LeBron's healthy, if Anthony Davis is healthy, I still have a hard time completely ruling them out because they're, they're that good. The Warriors are this – I just refuse to, like, believe that this team is just done. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't it, – it's, it's not logical this late in the season to look at that record and look at that team and still think there's a potential finals run there. But I still believe in it. Um, we know what the advanced stats are and even the traditional stats are for their starting five. We know how good their, their top six is. Um, it, it's They have to get healthy. They do have a lot of miles on them. I, I, I you know I, I'm predicting nothing, but I still believe there's a possibility of, of a run there uh, if healthy. And I, I don't know that anybody off the buyout heap is, is really going to change their trajectory. Uh, we asked Amin this earlier, and I'll ask you too. How many times have you seen a team that has been so profoundly poor at playing consistent defense as the Warriors and ended up making a deep run in the playoffs? I know he mentioned uh, the one Laker team, um, but for the most part, he says it's almost unfathomable to you know, be 28th in the league in points allowed and then all of a sudden get religion once the playoffs starts. So there's a couple editions of the Lakers, I think, that did that. Um, I'm thinking even back to, to when Shaq and Kobe were playing, and you know there was always this flip the switch thing. That was mostly about Shaq more than anybody else. He was the one who needed to flip the switch because he'd play his way into shape over the course of the season. Um, but there was a muscle memory there for that team, right? You, they knew how to do it when the time came. I think there were some late edition Cavs teams with LeBron's second run there that they did the same thing, where they were just kind of like messing around during the season and not inspired because they knew they had, you know, a deep run coming in, in the playoffs. And so it happens. And I think if a team has the experience of doing it before, you have a little bit more faith in their ability to flip that switch. The Warriors have done it. And so I, I, I still think they can replicate it when the time comes. Um, it doesn't happen often, and most teams can't do it. But I think a team that's already been there before and and again has that kind of collective muscle memory you have a little more faith that that they might be able to pull it off all that said again every bit of historical data every stat in the world points to oh you're 61 games into the season and you're game over 500 yeah i'm sorry you're not a contender like that's the logical response based on everything we know and and as i say the warriors to me kind of defy logic and and all other data Howard, I'm going to give you multiple choice here. So you you, you got to tell us what you think is most likely to happen for the start of next season. You got A, which means Draymond Green is on this team, but Bob Myers is out. B, just switch it. Bob Myers is on the team. I guess four options. Bob Myers is on the team, and so is Draymond Green. And you got C, both of them are gone, or D, one of them are gone. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I didn't realize I was going to have to prepare for multiple choice questions on this <laughs> this radio show. Um, you don't have to prepare at all for this radio show because we certainly don't. <laughs> <laughs> They're letting you run it tonight, Ray, which, I mean, on its own, like, talk about risky. Um, so, um, you have no I idea. Be- <laughs> I don't, I, I still don't believe that Bob Myers is actually going to end up somewhere else. Um, there hasn't been a lot of information to glean on this whole front, but uh, I just can't imagine that ownership group wants to let him walk. Now, if, if Bob, for some reason, has just decided he, he's ready to do something else entirely, that's a different uh, matter. But if it's just a, a question of them coming to terms and deciding how much he's worth, uh, he's worth a ton, and they'll figure it out. So I don't think Bob Myers is gone on the merits. 
Draymond, you know, it, it's it's an option, right? So a lot of this is is in his, uh, you know, in his control. Um, does he want to change the scenery at this stage? Do the Warriors want to, you know, you know, if he if he stays on, if he opts in, and do they, would they want to trade him for the sake of just shaking things up? But I, I just here's what I come back to, guys, on all of this. If the Warriors still believe that there is life left in this dynasty, and if they believe that at the highest levels, and certainly Joe Lacob is one who has been very, you know, stubborn in his belief in this team, and you know, look, they all had to concede finally on the James Weissman point. They they finally conceded that, you know what, the the future is unknown. We should focus on the present. Let's just do what we can to win now. To me, that was a healthy sign, making that deal as 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 fraught as that deal was on multiple uh, levels. It was the right move. If you're still investing in the present right now, I got to think that that's still the approach in the summer, which means try to get another year out of and hopefully a healthy year out of your core. And finally, just dovetailing off uh, Alan's question about Myers, um, what's the advantage for Joe Lacob in letting this play out the way it did? What's the logic behind that? And if there isn't any logic, wouldn't that sort of indicate that maybe this franchise is about to have a philosophical sea change? Always possible. Sometimes these things happen when you least expect it, right? Um Nobody saw it coming when when Jerry West left the Lakers. You know, just as they were starting their their three P run. Um, occasionally, there's just there's just some philosophical splits or financial expectation splits, uh, maybe combinations thereof. If if he walks, th- look, there's still other possibilities, right? It, it could still be look that maybe Bob Myers just wants a new challenge, or maybe he just wants to do something different, or maybe he's just burned out. I, like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to any of that, and I'm, I'm just throwing out possibilities. If Bob Myers wants to stay and they don't want to resign him, either because uh, they've decided they want to move on to somebody else, which sounds ludicrous, or because they don't want to pay the asking price, also ludicrous given how much they spend on everything else, that would be shocking to me. That would be really shocking. But, again, sometimes organizations get a little high on themselves and think that, well, you know, we can succeed without this guy, despite him being the architect of, of this entire era. You know, we're, you know, the organization's bigger than any one person. That happens sometimes. There gets to be some institutional arrogance. I don't know if that's the case here. But if you're asking for what would the logical reason for, to be to, to let him walk, if he still wants to be there, I, I cannot come up with one. Well, you don't have to leave. Well, actually, you do have to leave. Myers doesn't, but we have we are we're we're happening upon a break, so we will free you from this hellscape that was <laughs> the Damon and Ratto show. We'll talk to you soon, though. Thanks for thanks for everything, and keep your head up. Appreciate it, fellas. Thank you. Right. Take care, Howard Beck, who's a definite go-to guy. I like him a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think let's it- have him on at five fifteen. Yeah, there you go.